Welcome to the Artist Advisory Hotline, the podcast for artists who want valuable guidance and honest answers on how to grow their careers and develop their new project from leading art world experts and artists. Here's your host and founder of the Artist Advisory, Marina Press Granger. Tune in as she gets you the answers you deserve. Hello, artists. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm your host, Marina Granger. If this is your very first time tuning into the podcast, I wanted to introduce myself and tell you a little bit about why I do this. So I worked in galleries and generally in the New York City art world for 15 years before I started this company, The Artist Advisory, in 2018. I was a gallery director for many years, and I truly hated seeing artists get the runaround. And this was happening everywhere. So I decided to start this company because artists have so much more power than you could even imagine (laughs) because without artists, there is no art world. And so it's been a true pleasure helping artists navigate the art world and being the connector between the two sides. And I got to tell you, it's been so fun. And that is why I started this podcast. So I could interview art world experts, artists, whoever is going to help us lift the veil and see what's going on on the other side. And speaking of the other side, while I use very practical business tools and help artists could grow their career that way, I also use some spiritual tools as if you couldn't tell if, you know, maybe you are looking at the episode titles and you're like, Hey, there's a Reiki master on last time. Uh, so I am a Reiki master. I practice classical Chinese feng shui and I do so much more, but I have to tell you, it is one of those things where if you wanted to really grow your career, it's so important to grow internally as well. And so this podcast is all about that. It's about growing internally, uh, spiritually, and practically, or yeah, practically. And so uh, in today's episode, we have such a great guest. We have an interview with one of my favorite artists, Christy Gordon. I'm so honored that she came on to speak with us. I want to tell you that it was such an illuminating conversation and I love, love, love talking to her on this topic because she's so passionate about it. And it is about how artists can truly discover their artistic voice. Now, before we dive in, I have to tell you, if you look into the show notes, you'll see a link to register for her free workshop, which is on June 29th, on how you can find your artistic voice. So be sure to do that. It's going to be amazing. But also listen to this episode. And if you enjoy it, please don't hesitate to leave us a five-star review because it helps us get our podcast out to more people. So let me tell you a little bit about Christy's accomplishments. Just so you, I'm going to hype her up. I'm going to be her like cheerleader right now. Uh, First and foremost, um, most important accomplishment (laughs) is that she figured out the Yeti microphone. Okay. I have been using the Yeti for this whole podcast, basically. And I could never figure out which setting to put it on. There's like four settings and I've even taken courses on how to podcast and I could never figure this out until I got on the line with Christy and uh, in, you know, before we started our interview, I saw she also had a Yeti microphone and she also has a podcast called Down to Art. So tune into that as well. And I was like, hey, um, what? setting should I use? And she's like, the one that looks like an upside down heart. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is great. And while I was editing the interview, 
the sound was so good. So Christy, thank you so much. You're an angel. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Christy, uh, now lives and works in New York city where she received her MFA from the New York Academy of art. She also has a BFA in drawing and painting from the Ontario College of Art and Design, and she is originally from Canada. She's won no numerous awards and grants, and one of the most notable is the Blue Review Art Prize in 2021. She's also uh, received the Elizabeth Greenshields grant and so much more. Her work has been featured in amazing publications like The Artist Magazine, Southwest Art, Fine Art Connoisseur, and she's been on TV on Bravo Star Portraits. And Christy, I don't think we talked about this, but I've also been on Bravo. Ah, but this podcast is about Christine, not me. So anyway, I won't tell you more. So <laughs> it's embarrassing. So I have to tell you, um, Christy teaches uh, occasionally and she has so many great courses at ChristyGordonCourses.com, but she's also taught at the Academy of Realist Art in Ottawa and lectured at the Central, uh, sorry, the China Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing. She is represented by Grenin Gallery in Sag Harbor, where her work will be included in a group exhibition opening up soon, and the Cube Gallery in Ottawa, Canada, and Dacia Gallery in New York. So without further ado, here we go. Hello, Christy. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's so great to have you here. Hi, Marina. Thank you so much for having me. I love to see you. I love to see your work. And I can't wait for our listeners to get to know you a little bit more if they don't know you already. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could start off by telling us a little bit about your journey as an artist. Yeah. Well, I uh, remember being about nine years old and telling my mom that I wanted to be an artist. So, so I always knew. Um, and, and that day I have this vivid memory. We were like in the garden and she told me that it wasn't a good career option, <laughs> that you couldn't make a living as an artist. And I was so upset because up to that point, mom had been telling me like, oh, you can be anything, just like whatever you want to be. And here I was telling her that I wanted to be an artist. And she was saying I couldn't do that. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so, yeah, fast forward a while, I ended up going into animation um, because I didn't think I was like, OK, fine, it's not an option. So I went into animation and then um, the studio owner of the first animation studio that I ever worked at, he was actually a really well-known local painter named Philip Craig. And I was like, what? I've been lied to. Like, I didn't even know this was possible. Here he is. Like, and he was making a, like a, a lot of money too. And he did these big, beautiful landscapes that were like luscious and um, really instantly recognizable as a Philip Craig. And I started to take classes of him. And pretty soon I got into a gallery through like connection with him. And, and it was sort of the start of my like um, sort of career of kind of um, being highly influenced by the teachers that I was learning from. And where were you when this was happening? Were you uh, in New York already? Because I, you're New York based now. Oh, true. So um, I grew up in Canada in a teeny little town called Nelson. And then I had moved across the country over to the capital of Canada, Ottawa. And um, so that's where I was living when I met Philip Craig. Um, and I was just elated, like pretty soon after getting into a gallery, you know, and I was selling landscapes, I ended up leaving my animation job and I was just like blown away. Like here I was doing the impossible, like I was so happy. Um, but over time I started to, you know, you kind of get an extra desire underneath the first one. At first I was just like elated to be an artist. Like I couldn't believe it. It was a dream come true. But then I wanted a little bit more. The landscapes weren't like my true voice, you know, and, and I started to just want, yeah, my own true expression, you know, um, and, and I started to get interested in figures. I've, I've always been interested in figure, like painting people, like even since I was a teenager. And so I ended up taking some classes at various academies, but then what sort of happened is the like 
training, which was so amazing, like this highly technical, like academic training, which I had like longed for. And I couldn't believe it when I started to paint paintings that looked really realistic. But it actually, I, it was kind of a double-edged sword because then that became a bit of a box and it became harder to like have my own free, unique creative expression flow out of me, even though I had like the technical skills that I had always longed for, you know? Um, and I also felt all this, uh, there was sort of like some judgment that I was like kind of getting thrown at me, like about how I'm not like a real artist with a capital A and things like that. And it would hurt me so much. Like all I ever wanted to do was be an artist, you know, and, and here I was like seemingly being an artist, but I wasn't like respected as an art, like, you know. And, and what, it, what constitutes a real artist to I these know. people who were judging you? Like what was the thing? You know, what was... Well, there was, I mean, some of it, they might have been really like looking for more conceptual, really like highly developed ideas. But I think for a lot of them too, it was just having this like unique, distinctive voice that um, like, for example, there was a gallery, kind of a prestigious gallery that I was like super honored to start showing with. But every time I would meet with the gallery director, she would lecture me about how I needed to have like a message in my work. And I was like, so confused like she would show me around all the work in her gallery lecturing me about how I needed to have like a message and a style but her art so like none of it really had a very clear message it was like subtle you know and I went back to my studio and painted these like highly developed you know message paintings and it was kind of over the top um but yeah and I would cry after every meeting with her like I was so confused about what this whole thing was like I knew I wanted to be like a real artist but I didn't exactly understand like what it was all about like um uh, yeah and so eventually in frustration I decided to like go get my BFA at the Ontario College of Art and Design and then uh you know I got more experimental in my work but again I was kind of highly influenced by whatever artists I was looking at so my work would tend to look mostly like them you know um and then still running from this feeling of not being educated enough in art I like went and got my MFA at the New York Academy of Art and I just kind of continued to like compare myself to everyone around me and not feel good enough um and then and so at that point I had put like all of my money all of my time like everything of my whole life into this whole passion for being an artist and I was like in so much debt and I still didn't feel like I had found my voice as an artist. Um, and, and it was like a real bottom for me. Um, and uh, I don't know, there was just like this day where I just like kind of, I'd been listening to Napoleon Hill, um, his Think and Grow Rich series. I don't know if you've probably listened to it. And um, one part that I really love in it is, I, you know, I need to like listen to it again, but something about like burning the bridges behind us like you go all in and you like burn the bridge behind you so that you have no escape plan you know and I realized that that was like where I was at like I literally had put all of my money plus way more you know I was in a lot of debt and and I wasn't good at anything else I didn't want to be good at anything else but I had put like everything into into this and so I had to figure this out and it was almost like a divine in intervention because um yeah, I feel like something took pity on me that day. And all of a sudden I was writing up this list of a plan for myself of daily actions that I would take. And I did it as a 21 day challenge. And, um, and, and yeah, and then it was through that, that I kind of found my voice. And we can talk about that more. I feel like it went off on a tangent, but that's the summary. I love that so much. And Christy, yeah, I am, I consume money mindset books so much uh, because I think that one of the biggest, you know, after working in galleries, I've realized that one of the biggest misconceptions about the art world is that artists don't make any money. And oh, yeah. Yeah, I was like, there's so much money flowing around here. And I had to get over my own money mindset blocks to be able to grow my business and to help artists and doing the same with them is a huge thing. But I love that idea of burning the bridge uh, after you cross it, because what that does is it raises your baseline. Like all of a sudden you're like, nope, I'm not going back. I have a new uh, level that I'm at. 
and it does feel a little bit uh, uncomfortable maybe at first, but you know, we're here, we're sitting here and you made it, you did it. And I can't tell you how much, so I didn't go to art school, obviously I'm not an artist, but the artists that I work with, it's, and the artists that would come into the galleries where I worked, it, this is so true. They don't teach you how to find your voice in art school. And it's literally the only thing that helps me sell or helped me sell work, right? So this is so, so important. Um, I, I'm curious to get your opinion on this because when I was working in, at art fairs, I had like two seconds to get somebody's attention about the work, right? They would show interest. They would ask me about it. And then I developed this thing called the elevator pitch. So I would tell them why, uh, well, first I would tell them how the perspective of the artist informs the work, then why the artist makes the work, and then talk to them about it. So instead of saying like, hey, <laughs> this artist uh, paints realistic nudes, <laughs> I would say something like, well, you know what, this artist was really interested in anatomy, actually studied anatomy in medical school. And just before going and graduating, decided to become an artist to explore anatomy on a different level. And so here we have blah, 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 right? So <laughs> curious to know your opinion on that. Oh, I think that's like brilliant. And actually, like, I love the whole art, like elevator pitch thing that like I've worked with you like about this. And oh, I'm yeah, just, like, that's right. Oh, my God. Like workshopped on this over dinner. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and I came, I totally spaced. I spoke to your group about it, too. Yeah. Yes. And, and so I just like love this idea because actually, I mean, it's so important and I haven't heard this from anyone else. It's like we should all be talking about this. Every time I tell someone I'm an artist, the very next question is like, what do you paint? You know, and. Uh, but I like the way you've broken it down, like into sort of talking about the background and, and then also like talking about why they do it and like what it looks like. Um, and it's interesting as I think about this whole like finding your voice thing, because one of the things that we do, you know, in the framework that I've developed is like look at your background and how it might influence like, you know, our work. And then, yeah, and then, yeah, thinking about why and thinking about what exactly it looks like. And it's just interesting that your elevator pitch almost condenses that into a nice conversational way of like sharing it. Because once we found our voice, it doesn't mean we know how to tell people what our art looks like when someone asks us. Oh, yeah, yeah, there is that. <laughs> that helps. Um, but, you know, that's ultimately it creates a story and people mem remember stories like we're natural storytellers as humans like that's how we create history right um well i mean there's a lot that goes into how we create history um we're not going to get into that this is not a politics <laughs> podcast but um it's interesting that that's what makes people remember they're not like oh you know that those nudes over there they're like oh that guy that likes anatomy <laughs> yeah no you're so right like the the storytelling is like the most memorable and somehow it makes it more relatable like it's not just someone telling something at us <laughs> we can suddenly kind of get involved in it yeah I love that so Christy tell me a little bit about how you found your voice and uh, the journey that you went on with that and maybe offer some tips if if you can we can talk about this even later on in the podcast about how artists can find their voice I know um, there's something really exciting that you can share with us too so but anyway go ahead totally yeah so as I mentioned I basically wrote this magical list down which I called my daily miracle actions plan um, and I did it every day and I was doing it as a 21 day challenge because it takes 21 days to build a new habit. It can vary from person to person, but it's like a pretty good starting point. So I wrote down to paint for 25 minutes a day um, and I would do one thumbnail a day, which is like a quick sketch of a painting idea. And I would do one intuitive painting a day. I'll talk about what each of these are in a second. And then I would also like read one interview with an artist or like article about an artist every day because we need to like know our world kind of thing. And then also art school doesn't teach you very much about color and composition. So I kind of came out and I still didn't quite know how to like compose a painting or how to like use color, you know. So I started to read 
once a day some article any article about color like color theory color mixing and, and composition eventually I'm pretty sure I read everything that can be read on those two subjects um and yeah and so like with the painting for 25 minutes a day what I discovered is that like for all of these years that I'd been struggling I had this idea that we needed to paint for like eight hours a day like that's what a good artist does and it would like I would do that like for one day or something and then burn myself out and not paint for like an entire week. Um, and it would be like, I was getting more and more blocked as all of the like disappointments were sort of mounting up on me. So the idea of painting for eight hours a day was like total torture. Um, so this 25 minutes a day kind of like broke me out of the artist block because what I discovered is that I could like always know like 25 minutes. Okay. I would just work focused and it would be like, like I would work faster because I sort of had a plan and I would look at my paintings and like this up oh you can't see it's a podcast never mind like a painting that I was working on at the time that had all these like flowers and mystical creatures in the in the painting um you know I might look at this totally overwhelmingly complex painting but I might know like one area to work on maybe I didn't know what to do with the mystical creatures or what to do with like all parts of it but there might be like a flower <laughs> that I knew what to do and so I would spend that 25 minutes a day working on that flower and as time went on I would get kind of epiphanies as I worked that would kind of guide me like okay now I suddenly think I do know what to do with this mystical creature and and so that's like that's that was kind of the biggest breakthrough like just working consistently is kind of what opens the doorway for epiphanies to enter my work so over time I would like gain confidence that I would eventually figure out what to do <laughs> with the work um yeah, and then doing like a thumbnail, which is a quick sketch of a painting idea, like every day, just kind of like rapid firing out like any ideas that I had. And some of them were good and some of them weren't. And some of them I would take and develop into like a finished painting. But just having that sketchbook full of ideas, like for whenever I wanted to start a new painting. And, and one of the other things that I think was the most pivotal of the whole thing was doing an intuitive paintings every day once a day just like a 10 minute thing where you would just like I would roll out crepe paper on my on my large floor in Bushwick and get like kids acrylics paints out and you would just do the very first thing that came to mind and not judge it so like on my YouTube channel I just did a video of me doing this where you just like you know whatever the very first idea is so when I was doing the YouTube video it was like maybe do a pink sun like and you just don't judge it you just whatever the very first idea is and it's a great way to kind of um, get past the logical side of our mind and just get in touch with our intuition in our work um, and then sometimes the paintings the intuitive paintings that I did were actually really cool and became studies for um, you know like larger like the one of the largest paintings I had ever done that kind of became the painting that I had started you know and I didn't know how to do it when I started and by the end I had like found my voice and figured out <laughs> how to do paintings like that um yeah and yeah and then and then as I kind of touched on reading like an interview with an artist every day and like reading about color theory and composition these things that are just like kind of knowing our world and refining our craft so that eventually as it all came together in my work um, the process now kind of looks like working somewhat intuitively as I get started and then kind of bringing in the tools of my craft, you know, color theory, technique, composition to kind of like refine it and make it kind of work as a cohesive painting. But, uh, but yeah, I think like the, you know, there was a big external like transformation after going through this, which was that once I found my voice, kind of all these doors opened up for me, like a solo show fell into my lap, my social media account like started to grow. Um, you know, people started to recognize my art because it was like recognizable and it, it, everything just kind of fell into place. Like all of these things that I'd kind of been struggling with because it is like the most important thing. Like, as you mentioned at the art fairs, like, you know, the artist has to have this like recognizable unique style that's like distinctive and it's kind of what the whole thing's kind of resting on. So, but I yeah. think the most important transformation that happened was the internal one where I now know that I can figure out a painting. I'll start a painting and not know where it's going, but I'll know that epiphanies will guide me and by the end, you know, it'll eventually get to the place where I want it to be. And, and that confidence is, um, it's so like eternally fulfilling to have work 
like that is created in this way. It's not like just imposing a style on ourselves and being like, aha, this will be my voice. You know, I think the galleries will like it. Instead, it's actually coming from like an internal satisfaction. That is so beautiful. And uh, it's a few, few points I want to touch on. I love that you were saying that, you know, you start with this intuitive painting and sometimes it doesn't make sense right away, but you reserve that you don't judge yourself, right? Um, it's crazy because we are our own like toughest critics. And so sometimes just being mindful of that and releasing that is so important because while it might not seem like everything is like falling into place and it's, you're like, wait, this doesn't make sense together. It does make sense for you and allowing yourself to channel those things gets you to discover what everything's all about right yeah so I wanted to ask you also you um and I feel like I know your answer here but this idea of like let's paint what's trendy all right <laughs> so tell me about what you think about that well I've tried that <laughs> Of course, as an artist, like at our first goal, first we're like, if I could just be an artist, I'll do anything, <laughs> you know? So it's like, whatever, fine. If they want me to do whatever, I'll paint that if that's what it work. But then eventually um, it just becomes so boring. Like for me, I, you know, I had left my animation shop to start like, like, and I like landscapes to look at them, but to paint them, I was getting really bored. Like initially I was enamored by creating lighting effects and, you know, all of that. It was like interesting to me, but eventually... It just felt like being a glorified photocopier. I don't know. And I was like, I should have stayed in my animation job. It was you know, better money. <laughs> um, yeah. And then I just had no choice. I had to like change. You know, I had to change. I had to go with the movements of my soul and, and go into sort of painting figures. And but the inconvenience of going that route, which like I think a lot of people might naturally go down if you don't kind of consciously decide to like look for your voice is that it's really inconvenient every time you change styles. Like I had to leave my gallery every time I like suddenly made a big change, you know? So um, yeah, it's a, it's a lot better to just start. And the thing is like my voice has evolved since I kind of did this 21 day challenge and found my voice and everything. But my it, there's always been this thread of like, it's like I did find my voice and there's the same threads of interest. It might evolve and be slightly you know, it just evolves a little bit, but the galleries have stayed with me because there's still that thread of similarity, like running through all of it. Mm. And I want to talk about galleries for just a moment, because there's something so valuable about finding your voice, making sure it's authentic. And like you said earlier, because when you know it's truly authentic to you, you can consistently make the decisions on what to paint next or what to make next. And in galleries, it's so important for, you know, when we were ever considering showing an artist, we needed to make sure that they were consistent in their style, in their message, because we didn't want to get a curveball all of a sudden, you know, you sign an artist and they have a beautiful solo show and the next show looks totally different. And, uh, and then the collectors are like, wait, what's going on here? <laughs> so that is super important. So when you find your voice, you stick to your voice, right? You are authentic in the way that you communicate. And stylistically, here's an exception though. Like it doesn't have to all look identical, but as long as the intention is consistent, right? As long as your voice is consistent, you can create sculptures, paintings, different series, as long as they fall into that voice. Yes. Ooh, that's so true. And I love that you mentioned that. And you see more and more artists these days doing that. Like there was that artist at the new museum wing, Yaki Mutu. And like she's like an amazing artist at like um sculpture and painting or and the collage. Yeah, and it was a clear voice in all different mediums. That's like such a good point. Um but yeah, but you are so right about, yeah, I forgot to mention the collectors. It's extremely inconvenient to go ahead and change your style midway through your career. I don't advise it. <laughs> so it, it, yeah, it's better to kind of explore our voice. And like, 
a lot of the time as artists, we never feel good enough technically. That's the other thing. Like all along my journey, I never felt like I was good enough technically. So I know um, a lot of the artists that I work with and it's so normal for us to feel like we're not good enough technically to start exploring our voice, but actually we can do the two like in tandem sort of together. Um, and a lot of the time our voice comes somewhat naturally to us, even though it still is like, there's still art challenges, but um, so it might not be as much of a struggle as like struggling away, trying to paint some other artist style or kind of thing. Totally. And when you say that, you mean when it comes to your technique, right? Like you yeah. could be better in your technique, which sounds absolutely absurd coming from you. Like, I think your paintings are literally perfect. <laughs> but okay, sure. <laughs> but I don't feel good enough technically and nobody ever will. <laughs> so we need to like kind of start exploring our voice even before we feel like, aha. Like I'm ready. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like it's never going to happen. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, that's the thing. It's like, don't wait till you feel ready because a year, look, it, it's like, I remember I like, I'm going to get a little like vulnerable here and this is not exactly art, <laughs> but I I was a ballet dancer for a long time. And then when I quit ballet, I was a teenager and <laughs> I gained, I gained so much weight like instantly. And I lost it pretty quick too, but it was like absurd. It was like 50 pounds in six months. It was like, boom. And, and then I lost it luckily, but um, maybe not all of it to be honest, <laughs> but whatever. Um but I kept waiting. I was like, I can't do anything until I lose this weight. Like I can't, um, I can't, you know, go hang out with my friends. I can't shop. I'm not gonna. And I had such a crappy experience waiting and it taught me so much like that moment where I'm like, you know what, you just don't know what tomorrow will bring. So consider yourself as perfect as you are in the moment and do your best, right? Like there's no such thing as perfect. Oh, I like love that. Oh, that's such a sweet story too. And and I was like totally thinking about that just like this morning actually, like, because I think you and I, even with like our podcast and all that we do, and this is like some, you know, I think this really relates to like art career advice is that like, we have to just do it and we're going to not do it perfectly. Like there's no chance that we'll do it perfectly the first time. Of course, we'll try to do everything as good as we can or whatever, but like, it's definitely not going to be perfect. You have to kind of just do it anyways. And that's the most important thing. Like, even when it comes to say posting your first reel on Instagram, like you have to post it, <laughs> you can make it as good as yeah. possible and then you have to post it and then you'll figure out that it's not perfect and you'll figure out how to make it better. And maybe by your like, hundredth reel it'll be perfect but that you have <laughs> or by your 10th who knows yeah, or your 10th yeah get some take some take dina's class you'll get it very faster <laughs> yeah, shout out to dina brodsky <laughs> totally. um but also i gotta say like here's a perfect example i'm like looking at your work and i literally think it's like flawless and perfect oh, and you're like okay. no i can't <laughs> and so you know here's an example of you know, somebody being their own toughest critic. That's so true. And the other thing that's so important about that is that the perfection can be a major blocker. Like, uh, so we have to figure out how to work around the, like the perfection can stop us from working at all, <laughs> you know, and it's like, a, yeah, it's really common. So it's like, so worth realizing yeah. that we're, yeah, not listening to that constant voice in our head. But it's like, do, 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 do. <laughs> I remember when I was writing my master's thesis, I, it was like pulling teeth. Like I could not, I just, oh. I was like, I can't do it. I just, I can't, I, I don't know. Every word <laughs> is wrong. Right. <laughs> and, um, and then I read this book that you, I'm sure, you know, the war of art by Stephen yes. Pressfield. I should read it again. I mean, I should read it again, but I'm procrastinating. <laughs> it's okay. You're doing a lot. <laughs> um, anyway, um, for those of you who don't know this book, it's uh, it helps you stop procrastinating <laughs> um, by getting over your perfectionism. Yep. A hundred percent. Oh, that's, I think that's where I got the ideas about 
yeah it was like really useful yeah I think we all struggle with that as artists so at least having this like framework around it helps us know what's going on <laughs> absolutely and uh Christy I wanted to just kind of like pivot our conversation to galleries right we, we already touched upon them a little bit but you actually came in and spoke to one of my groups and you gave uh such valuable insight on uh, working with galleries and getting to work with galleries. You are just your exhibition history, your CV, it's so impressive. And I knew that I had to invite you to speak to them because you are the the icon here, right? Like you're a successful artist. And uh, yeah, I hope your mom's listening. <laughs> um, no. um, but anyway, so... Uh, what advice do you have uh, for gaining uh, or starting to work with galleries? Like, I know we touched about, we talked about that a little bit already, but how did you gain gallery representation? What do you recommend to artists on getting that? Yeah, so it's good to be pretty proactive, like in this, in this matter. Um, so what, what I would sort of suggest is start to like, go go around to all the galleries in your area and make a list of like kind of take notes afterwards this is what I would do take notes about exactly what the gallery looked like the kind of work that they show just like familiarize yourself with every single gallery in your area and while you're in there and actually I want to pick your brain about this because I know you used to be at a gallery I always suggest that they talk to the person at the desk and sometimes that's going to be the gallery owner and sometimes it'll be um, like someone who works at the gallery in New York it's often not the gallery owner but a lot of the time in other cities it is the actual gallery owner and so the the sort of format for this visit would be to go into the gallery look at all of the work on the wall don't go in with your portfolio and don't go straight to the desk memorize the name of an artist that's hanging on the wall you know look at something that they're doing technically maybe the technique that they're using with the textures and the lights or whatever and then go up to the person at the desk and just casually strike up a conversation like oh I really you know I love the show you know I love the work like I really like what so-and-so name artist is doing with the textures and the lights here um and then you know the gallery owner or the person working at the desk they know that you're an artist what do you think they always know right you already well know. I feel like they know when you mention light <laughs> like oh. literally <laughs> like um <laughs> not um it's very rare that a collector in my experience oh. will come up to me and start talking to me about the light although it has happened <laughs> but uh, talking about the technical qualities of a work of art yeah probably <laughs> Oh, that's good. This is useful information. <laughs> I, I never thought of it that way because you kind of want them to know that you're an artist, but you don't necessarily, I wouldn't suggest saying I'm an artist. I've tried that. It's, it's not good. They want to run. They want to run. Right? Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. So you want them, you know, we both know that they know and you don't need to tell them. And then eventually just like, I would kind of say like, oh yeah, I really like admire the work you show. You know, I was just wondering what your submission process is, what, um, is like. Would you like to see a hard copy like e mailed to you or would you prefer an emailed submission? And so you're giving them a question that they have to answer. And at that point, they'll either say, oh, I prefer a hard copy or I'll prefer an email. Um, <laughs> and so where they, so you're kind of slipping, this might help you slip through the cracks because if you ask them, are you accepting submissions? They'll say no. <laughs> but if you ask them, which you know um which way they prefer to see submissions it kind of shows that you're advanced enough in the art world that you have like some like knowledge of these matters and they might be like kind of curious and they just answer the question and, and I really like so so far the one thing that jumps out at me that's kind of brilliant <laughs> is that you're not asking them a yes or no question you're uh -huh. asking them how uh-huh <laughs> how can I get you to look at my work, basically. Exactly. And you will find that they'll have blurted out the answer before they even know what's happening. And they'll have said email or one gallery might have said hard copy, but everyone else says email, but you just give them the question. And then you're like, oh, that's great. Like, what email should I address it to? <laughs> and and then get the definitely get the person's name and their email. And then immediately when you get home, send them a greeting card. I like to get my cards made on Moo and they have images of my work. Send them a greeting card. Oh, dear so-and-so, it's such a pleasure to talk to you in your gallery. You know, this morning, I really admire the work you show and I'm excited to introduce you to my work soon. Reminding them that they ever met you. 
And then you've warmed the waters by the time you get it together and send them your packet. And the packet will contain, if it's an email, which it normally will be, it, you know, you might even ask them when you're talking to them how many images they would prefer in an email because different galleries have different preferences for that. But a lot of the time it's like between three to eight for an emailed submission. Um, the old way with the hard copy, it would normally be 12 images. So a lot of the time it's a few less images in email. And then you'll also include your bio, your statement, your CV. The cover letter will be the body of the, the email. Keep it like really short, just, you know, that you include your them. very short elevator pitch. Oh, the, love yeah. it. Updating yeah. this to, yes. to refine. Include yes. a really short elevator pitch. <laughs> yes. Oh, I love that because I've always been like playing around with the different so-called cover letters, which is actually the email. Um, yeah, and I, I have discovered that keeping it very short, they don't want to read what you call like a wall of words, you know, definitely not like two yeah. brief paragraphs, maybe possibly. Maybe or, one. Oh, maybe one. Yeah, one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like short. It shows that you understand that they have no time for this. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah. And they're really excited to look at the work anyway. Yeah, they just want to skip to the chase and see the paintings. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so anyways, I would do this process, create a list where you've visited all the galleries and you now hash out a list of 10 galleries that you really truly think your work would be a good fit for. So you're looking for, you know, do they show, say you paint figurative paintings, do they show any paintings that are figurative, you know, and, and you want to make sure that they're showing emerging artists, you can kind of tell by the prices in the gallery, or um, if you kind of look at the CVs of some of the artists that they show. Um, so just really, truly making sure that you're, you really think you have a good shot at it. And once you've got this list of 10 galleries that you truly 100% think you have a good shot at getting into, then you send to all 10, you send this email or hard copy um, artist packet to all 10 all at once, you make a little checklist like I do, check it all off, write the date that you sent it, and then follow up in like two weeks. And you might it's either do that by email or by phone, but never in person. But and and I found basically the numbers are always one in ten. Every single time you'll get into one out of the ten, as long as you sort of follow every single step. I love that. Yeah, I just absolutely love this advice. And I got to tell you, like, if you if we were having this conversation like ten years ago, and uh, when I like maybe was still at a gallery, I'd be like, oh no. No, 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 don't do that. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. You're slipping through the cracks. They don't want But to actually, it. the more I think about it and the more, you know, the more experience I have with all of this on this side of the whole equation, I'm like, yeah, this is brilliant. <laughs> and so yeah, it's so brilliant because also if you have someone who's super rude or non-responsive to you on the gallery side, you can bet your bottom dollar that they're like that with the artists that they work with. And you don't want to be in a situation like that. Right. No. Um, so yeah, that is so wonderful. I also got to tell you, I have been a little judgy wedgy going into galleries lately because I like to uh, learn a little bit more about the artwork. Uh, I ended up kind of like accidentally falling into doing these like monthly art walks for Soho House. I so yeah. I you guys. Oh my God, totally. I would love that. Uh, but I, sometimes I go in there and I ask them to tell me a little bit about the work and it's so wild how these, or, or like sometimes when I want to buy something, it's so wild that the gallery does not explain to me how the artist perspective informs their work or tell me about the intention behind the work. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's so clear for me, you know, after a while, after I do my research and I take everybody on my art walk, uh, <laughs> it's easy for me to be like, okay, like this is uh, the deal, right? Like this is the elevator pitch, so to speak, but it's so weird that some galleries don't do that. For sure. Oh, that's interesting. And that makes a lot of sense. Because the other thing I've discovered as I do these kind of like going up to the gallery after having looked at all the work and just striking up some conversations usually about technique is that, yeah, it's surprising how like they're not very good at talking about art. <laughs> yeah. So it's like comforting for us as artists because I think this is the step that people are most terrified about, this idea of 
going up to what might be the gallery owner and striking up a conversation, it almost stops people from doing um, any part of this, you know? And, and another, you know, this is another like instance of like, you just have to do it. You won't be perfect the first time, but you get better and better. But it is comforting to realize like, we'll definitely be better at this conversation than they are, <laughs> you know? <laughs> we'll sound intelligent, you know? Well, um, I got to tell you when I was... Uh before I started working with artists so closely, I was petrified of <laughs> talking to an artist about their work. I was like, I'm going to say, yeah, I was like, whenever I was um, calling an artist to talk to them about like what to put in the press release or whatever, I'd be like, oh my gosh, what if I, what if, what if I get it wrong? <laughs> Oh, that's so endearing. I've never even thought of that because we're always so terrified to talk to you yeah. guys. <laughs> no, you know what it is? It's like anything you guys say is correct. And, <laughs> you know, the reason, uh, the way that I learned that was in uh, graduate school, we kept reading all of these artist uh, pr primary sources like manifestos or theoretical texts or, or texts on theory or whatever. And they were, if they were by an artist, then it was even if it was completely incoherent <laughs> and we had to figure out how to like decipher it because our professors were like whatever they say it's true it's about their work so figure it out <laughs> and um so everyone listening uh if you're an artist you're right <laughs> That's very comforting for us as yeah. artists because we feel like we're not. <laughs> no, everything you say is right. Um, <laughs> but it does help to hone in on what your voice is and communicate it. So, Christy, tell me, um, what is, I, you know, I didn't really ask you so much about your work, but in a nutshell, can you tell me a little bit about your work and your voice as an artist? Yeah, well, I think that I have always seen the world with a sense of magic, like growing up with my mom, she had like sometimes like kind of spiritual experiences and stuff. And uh, she s sort of put this sense of magic into my mind, sort of looking for signs and um, that things would kind of, yeah, signs would come to us and things like that. So um, I think because of that, when I started like painting these like multi-figure surreal kind of paintings um, and putting like mystical creatures and hybrid creatures sort of into in among us like in sort of what looks like our our real world it's kind of bringing the sense of magic and mystery into our everyday world so how do uh, I do let's judge my elevator pitch. I mean <laughs> perfect perfect <laughs> I mean I keep thinking about those I feel like you shared one of those like mystical experiences your mom had um, and when we were talking about this like ages ago, and it was so fascinating to me because, you know, uh, I feel like I told you this, but I got to tell you, I became a Reiki master very recently. And I have started to develop um, being a medical intuitive, I guess that's what it's called. Oh, like, I, yes. and so I'm actually going on a retreat uh, to develop that a little bit more in September. So yeah, it's been like really wild. Um, yeah. And I always use these spiritual tools when I work with artists, like I, or not always, but starting now, like starting very recently since I've gained them. And it's so much fun. Like I've been doing um, crystal grids for my clients, like in general, like for their situation. And it's been really amazing. I don't know if you know what those are. No, tell oh. me. <laughs> okay. I, crystal grids are like, um, you arrange crystals in a uh, formation over like sacred geometry and underneath it, you put an intention mm -hmm. for, uh, to put out into the universe and you charge them daily. Wow. Uh, for that situation. So um, I mentioned this in my previous, I think I mentioned this in my previous podcast, but I recently did them for one of my clients uh, specifically to get her to start to work with a gallery that would get her to her goals. Right. And this was so like out of left field, but 
she reached out to a gallery that is international and shows at all of these art fairs and literally the next day they sent her back such a positive email and oh. normally this happens it just takes a little longer than right away <laughs> yeah, um, or it doesn't happen <laughs> yeah or it doesn't happen uh, right okay fine <laughs> um but you know uh it, it was one of those moments and I'm like oh now I can do it more so now when I teach my group or teach a class I'm like oh I just want them to get the information they really need from this and yeah. things like that it's amazing. It's like magical and powerful. Like it, there's really something to it. It was actually you. I have one of these corner desks and I think I sent you a photo of my cute little corner desk in a corner once. And you were like, oh, Christy, <laughs> for Feng Shui, you can't have your desk like facing into a corner and like it should be facing towards the front door. So even right now, as I'm sitting here, I've got my corner desk, not in the corner, facing towards the front door. And my everything started to happen and build as soon as I moved that desk. <laughs> I am so glad. I <laughs> This is like my message. It's going to be uh, on my epitaph. But um, yeah, so now it's like an L-shaped desk, basically. Well, it's actually like a corner desk, but it's it's facing into the room so it's just got okay. one of its side at, up against the wall and it's yeah yeah good. yeah it's cute yeah it's oh, facing so the good it is powerful though that I think there's really something to it like uh, these things really actually it I know it can sound like if you haven't had these kind of experiences before it's hard to see how how it could happen but when you have I know that there's a lot of us out there who like understand these things it's really powerful and it makes a big difference so that's like an amazing like benefit that you can bring into your groups. Yeah. I got to tell our listeners a little bit about that, about the, where your desk should be facing and, you know, where your table is facing. It's really tough sometimes because in your studio, you want to get the best light. Right. Um, and a lot of artists, they put their desk up against the window. So the light comes in from the window my only suggestion there, if it's possible to configure it this way, you can anchor the side of your desk on the window so you get that light coming in, but sit in a power position where you see the entrance to whatever studio you're in. It's really optimal that you're not directly in front of it, that it's off to the side or something. But when you're sitting there and you see the entrance to your space, you are open to opportunity. You are open to collaboration. And also when you see the entrance, you feel safe and focused because when you have your desk up against the wall or looking out the window, you cannot see the entrance. And so on a very primal level, like our lizard brain or like amygdala or whatever is not allowing us to focus because subconsciously we're waiting for uh, an attack, right? Like we want to be prepared for that attack. So uh, in that way, you can't be giving a hundred percent to your work. That's really interesting. I didn't know the second piece, but it be, I did know you did tell me the first part about um, yeah, just it being receptive to opportunities and to collaboration. And that's exactly like what seems to come in as soon as I move my desk. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love this, Christy. I feel Me like too. whenever I get together with you, I'm like, oh my gosh, we sound so smart. <laughs> <laughs> um, Christy, I wanted to ask um, you for our listeners, just, you know, since we're on the spiritual vibe here, what's your sign? Oh, well, I'm a Taurus. Yay. So your birthday was like a month ago. Yes. Yep. It was about a month ago, May 3rd. Yep. Ah, okay. Almost when two is, now. When's yours? I'm <laughs> December 3rd. Oh, we're both. So I'm a Sagittarius, but, but we're both on the third. And as a matter of fact, like three is one of my favorite like numbers. Me too. So. Wow. Hey, <laughs> very interesting. So, um, okay. So Christy, what is coming up for you in terms of your work? Like, do you have exhibitions coming up? Yeah, actually, this is like a big year for me. And I'm actually starting to get a little bit panicked because there's so much coming up. There's a two person show coming up at Grenning Gallery in July, Grenning Gallery in Sag Harbor. And then 
in um, January and February of next year, I'll have a solo show at a gallery in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania. And it's a really big space that's really beautiful. So I'm kind of freaking out because I need to make a lot more paintings. And then as big, soon as that big shows ones? Over, big ones. <laughs> yeah. Yay. <laughs> and then as soon as that shows over, there'll be a show at um, Garvey Simon in Manhattan. So I'll definitely send you the invitation. That'll be in the spring. And I'm also writing a book right now on how to find your voice as an artist. And that, uh, well, the first manuscript needs to be written by the end of December. So, and then it'll be released in um, the spring of 2024. So there's just like a lot that I'm doing. I'm like already working hard to make sure it gets done. Oh, I love that. Right. So you're definitely not bored. No, I'm fully invigorated. <laughs> but you know, I, love but I love my life. It's actually like, it's all so satisfying. Like I'm so, you must feel this too. Like you and I both are living like a deeply fulfilling, satisfying life. and even when it's busy, like we're actually doing what matters to us. Absolutely. I don't even notice like the time go by in the day. I'm like, how is it eight o'clock? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. I'm so lucky. Yeah, I'm so grateful. I wanted to ask you, um, what do you, how do you work with artists? Because I know you do offer some services. Yeah, so once a month I teach um, for artists that are like looking to build their technique, a workshop uh, focused on painting the features. So um, last month I did the eye, this month I'll do the nose, and then there's the mouth and the ear. Um, so people can go to my website, christygordoncourses.com and check out what the monthly offering is in terms of the feature painting workshops. And those are just like one day workshops and you gain access to the online course too that you can watch for the rest of your life as well. And then for artists that want to develop their voice more, I have a three month program um, about how to find your voice as an artist called the Visionary Master Program. And it's gonna be starting in July. And I'm actually gonna be doing a free webinar on June 29th, just talking about how to find your voice as an artist and get, get, get into galleries and just gain confidence in your work without having to go through all the years of struggle and expensive art school that I've had to go through. Um, because I've kind of found that artists that I've worked with and I've like um, applied this framework, you know, we've worked through this framework, I see them start, it actually shocks me, it boggles my mind, uh, that I'll see them and they'll be like, oh, this is my first oil painting. And then they very rapidly move through like finding their voice and developing their technique sort of simultaneously. And then they, you know, get like a really distinctive, beautiful style, get picked up by galleries, grow their social media accounts. And it just all happens really rapidly for them. Like, and it, it literally boggles my mind because <laughs> it took me like 15 years, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it'll save them time. And money. <laughs> yes. Money. <laughs> A lot of money. So good. I love that. And how can they register for this free web webinar? Oh, yeah. So if you go to christygordoncourses.com, um, on the homepage, you'll see a link that says register for the free uh, how to find your voice webinar and you can just click the button and get registered and you could also if you have trouble finding that you can just email me at christy at christy gordon course uh, christy gordon.com so it's k-r-i-s-t-y at k-r-i-s-t-y g-o-r-d-o-n.com thank you so much christy for joining us today it was such a pleasure to speak with you oh thank you so much it was so great to Thank you so much for listening. Support your community by sharing this podcast, leaving a review, and follow The Artist Advisory on Instagram at the underscore artist underscore advisory. And visit us online at www.theartistadvisory.com.